Welcome back. Um, last time we were talking about the German V2 program, mm. uh, and we mentioned uh, Werner von Braun, who was the head of that. Um, uh, I'm just going to be working on a project that I've been I've been doing sort of on the side of my own sort of gameplay. Mm. Um, what I call it also. Um, uh, I'm trying to make a, a one stage orbital thing. We have we have some engines here that um, uh, are, can be both. Uh, air breathing as well as uh, using the oxidizer from fuel tanks. Um, so this one flies pretty all right, but I'm just going to mm. design it a little bit in the background. While you tell me about Werner von Braun sort of as a person, um, I think maybe I'll introduce and start with one mm. of his more famous quotes, which is when the V2 right. first tested, when it first launched. Not when it first tested. This is when it first launched on Britain. Mm. They had launched and tested V2 engines before, but he said it, when it launched on Britain. He said the rocket worked perfectly, except for landing on the wrong planet. Yeah. That says an immense amount about this person. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it definitely runs into, uh, into the nature of aspirational science, science for sure, because it, there, uh, there is a really, really... A gross, a gross argument, but one that can be made for sure that suggests that uh, that that Werner von Braun here um, didn't really give a shit about Nazi politics, um, and that's that's not at all to uh, to to you know give him any sort of justification or leeway. He was a, a, a disgusting human being, um, but his his goal was. W was not you know the 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 glory of the the Nazi regime. It was it was a, a a scientific goal, and he just didn't care about the cost of that. He 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 ultimately, um, he he was willing to work with the Nazi. Not just willing, he was enthusiastic about willing uh, about working with the Nazis, uh, because his goal was to get a rocket into space and. To uh, to perhaps uh, achieve you know uh, uh, achieve landings on other planets, um, and he was willing to do anything for that. And it it's definitely a, a really really upsetting and I you know again using the 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 understated adjective here just gross gross thing, um, where he he was he was willing. To, to work for whoever could provide the funding uh, and the resources uh, that, that he needed to go to space. He didn't care about what that entailed. Um, and uh, that, that definitely played a role in sort of what he was doing later in his life. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, is, is there anything, anything else you'd like to mention before we sort of move on to a different chapter in, uh. in Ferner? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's let's talk about the end of World War Two. Mm. I think that's that's the yeah. place to move from here. Yeah. Um, at the end of World War Two, so this this mountain base that we have mentioned before was um, further to the east mm. in Germany, uh, where perhaps some folks were closer than others. Um, the Nazi scientists look around. And they say, who is more likely to give us refuge? Is it the Americans or is it the Soviets? You'll never guess who they thought. Yeah. Um, so these rocket scientists pack up their research mm. and start taking trains west in the hopes that the American scientists will... And the American army. Yes, the American army yeah. will... Well, the American Army will make them American scientists. Yeah. Um, this worked. And uh, Werner von Braun moved to NASA. Well, he didn't move to NASA at first. NASA didn't exist at first. But mm -hmm. he moved into rocketry programs in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for reference, um, the, the Soviets didn't come away empty-handed. They, they did get to Middlewerk, um bef before the Americans and... In doing so, they uh, they managed to get their hands on a whole lot of uh, of of shiny new 
V2s. We, we, uh, the Americans definitely captured, um, definitely captured some, some V2s as well. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Soviets got the lion's share there. Um, and since, since they, they didn't have the Nazi scientists themselves, the, the, the next Soviet project for, for a good while there was to basically reverse engineer and create a Russian version of the V2, uh, which they eventually succeeded at. For reference, the the American rocketry program never recreated the V two. Mm-hmm. We just reused old V twos that we captured from World yeah. War Two, or not reused, but repurposed. Yes, repurposed. Yeah. No, um, they only flew once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Oh man. So in the U S. Verna was was was. Hailed as a as a as a you know a, a, a rocketry genius at this point Robert Goddard um, was too old to be alive I'll say um, well I mean he he was the, he was there for a little while but he was he was not in in really the the post World War Two yeah. uh, rocketry scene there there was there was a, a a sort of tragic moment in his life when he was uh when he was asked to to sort of dissect the V two as it were um. And sort of horrifyingly found that the components of the V two were almost identical to to American rockets that were being made at the time. There was there was a, an exchange between him and an assistant, <clears throat> where uh, the assistant said to uh, said to him, uh, "It looks like ours, Doctor Goddard," uh, and and Goddard merely replied, "Yes, it seems so." Um, this to me shows two things. One, that it was really only the Americans who were, I'll put it lightly and say, giving Goddard a hard time. Mm. Um, And that other, especially the rocketry um, uh, clubs, were really taking note of what he was doing. Mm. Um, To some degree, that is heartening, to know that your research is is being used somewhere. Um, but this goes to the other thing that, that that makes me sort of think of where really Werner von Braun then wasn't doing much new with the V2. Mm-hmm. He was just putting application to what had already been laid down. Um, he was just using the lessons that Goddard had been trying to teach. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just in sort of the application of those lessons um, that he was considered genius. Mm-hmm. Um And consequently, was then able to to be sort of the the rocketry head in the U.S. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. How did he? How did we decide to get him as the head? Because he wasn't at first. Yeah. No. So the American rocketry after World War II to, took some interesting directions. Um, it, it was it was acknowledged that at, at this point we we could only do so much with uh, with single stages. Um, there, there's a, a concept in rocketry called uh, single stage to orbit. Uh, thus far, it is impossible. Um, there, there are some projects that are working on trying to figure that out, but um, uh, to this point, hasn't been done. And what I'm trying to make, it's also uh, partially because it's bare, but then also one stage orbit. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I forgot and why this is to hop way, way in the future... One thing that, that makes people think that this could be theoretically possible is because uh, jet engines mm. are really good for getting speed when there's air, mm. and it makes you have to carry less oxidizer yeah. um, to, to put oxygen in because you're just taking oxygen from the atmosphere. There's plenty of that mm. to go around. Um, so instead, what I forgot to do and what I need to do right this moment is to put some air intakes mm. into uh, into my rocket. Yeah, that... That does that does bring up uh, a terrible oversight that we had way back in the first episode. One of one of the big distinctions between um, between solid and liquid fuel rockets is uh, solid fuel rockets pretty much fly on their own. Generally, you know, gunpowder and, um, and and sort of similar uh, similar compounds uh, that are just more volatile. Uh, they they kind of have their own their own oxidizer in there. They have nitrates that that, that burn. Um, they they will function just fine without anything else. Liquid fuel is gonna require something to provide the oxygen for the uh, 
for for the flame for the ignition. Uh, so or else it, it'll already be on fire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, so so you you have tanks, separate tanks, uh, for for both fuel and oxidizer, and then some pumps uh, put it together in the engine as it ignites. Um, but uh, but but jumping back out here, right? So single stage to orbit uh, is not is not a thing to this point, and uh, was certainly not a a, a, a a thing at at the time of, of post World War II um, America. So we started playing around with uh, with multiple stages. So a stage is is a, a different rocket firing or several rockets firing. It, it can be a few things. Um, that there there are different ways to do stages. There is. There's a, a stacked configuration and a parallel configuration. Stacked means you you take one rocket, you put it on top of another rocket, you uh, you you fire the first one, and then when it's going fast, you fire the second one. Uh, parallel is you just set two rockets on fire, taped to one another, basically. For some of the most emblematic uh, uh, views of this, you can think of the space shuttle, which mm. was several parallel stages, versus something like the Apollo, mm. which was stacked. Yeah. And so the the Americans uh, played around for a little while with with stacked configurations. Um, uh, they they did something called Project Bumper, um, which uh, was was putting together one of the Americans' pet projects called uh, the Whack Corporal, which uh, which was a, a, a skinny uh, and fairly short, but a, a skinny little rocket that had uh, had pretty good flying power, um, and a uh, a captured V two. Uh, so. It was a stacked configuration. Uh, Project Bumper was literally take a, a V2 and put a whack corporal on top, launch the V2 off, and when the V2 runs out of fuel, launch off the whack corporal. Uh, that got them really, really high in into the uh, into the air. Uh, things were looking optimistic, um, but then uh, then things started really heating up in uh, in the, uh, the the quote cold unquote war. Um, where, uh, there, there was, a, there was a really, really big, um, a, a really big premium being paid on the technological superiority of, of one power over the other. We'll get to that in a, in a later, a later moment, but, um, ultimately the, uh, the Americans were, were beaten into space. Um, the, the Russians got, got into space before we did. Um, they got a person into space before we did. They got, the, but but first satellite. Let's let's talk about satellites. So the the Russians got Sputnik into orbit, um, and that was just massive egg on the face of the Americans. The Americans needed to get out there really really quickly. Um, An interesting note about this too is that ooh they just switched over engines from uh, air to liquid. Um, let's see what our map looks like here. We're doing pretty good progress. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think this is going to be quite it. This isn't, isn't going to quite be the final design. Um, but I think that this is going to do us pretty good. Yeah. Um, surprisingly good for something that's just so chunky. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> but the Americans had announced the day for launching their first artificial satellite. Or the, the year. Yeah. No, no, they... So they announced the year and then later the date. Yeah, yeah. Previous, they they had announced that well in advance. The Russians came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The Soviets, I should say, came mm -hmm. out of nowhere um, <laughs> to launch it and uh, just surprised everyone. So Sputnik One launched on October fourth of nineteen fifty seven. Mm -hmm. The um, the U S had delayed their initial. Um, Initial uh, 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 launch date mm. a little bit to the sixth of December of fifty seven. Yep. And 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 it's important to note that at this point the Americans were actually working with sort of two different teams, two different projects simultaneously. Um, one of those projects was headed up by by Werner von Braun. Um, he uh, you know he and his team got a rocket together. They were they were pretty sure their rocket would fly. Uh, that it was that it, that it was ready that they could they could put something into orbit. Uh, the the Americans recognized that it was maybe a, a bad face to have our first satellite be put into orbit by a Nazi in Alabama in the fifties. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot going on in that. There was a lot there. Um, 
So I- instead, after um, after uh, after Sputnik launched, the the Americans said, "Okay, we're g- we're gonna have this second team, this other team. Well, well, the first team really. Uh, they they were the favorites, but they um uh, they." Well, well, you'll see. They, they they were working on something called Project Vanguard, um, and Project Vanguard <coughs> was uh, was elected to be the first thing that we were going to try to put into orbit. Um, the Americans, after Sputnik, rushed, put it on a launch pad, got uh, got ready, announced it to the whole world, uh, started broadcasting, and it it blew up really spectacularly on the launch pad incredibly bad uh i'll find a video and put it in the description mm. uh it was colloquially known as kaputnik yeah yeah so the americans recognizing that uh that didn't go the way they were hoping um realized that they they kind of needed a do over and the the rocket that was available for a do over was Werner von Braun's um, and his team. And it his should, team. It and should be team. noted. His team had other Nazi rocket scientists on it, too. This is true. But also some, some non-Nazi rocket some scientists. Some presumably non-Nazi yeah. rockets. We, we can hope. <laughs> and so, yeah, the first satellite launched into space, Explorer 1, mm-hmm. was launched by Werner von Braun and a, a team of... I almost said stolen. They weren't stolen. They voluntarily came over. Voluntary, uh, voluntarily uh, uh, became came to the U.S. Became I, U.S. There citizens. Might, there might have been some conditional stuff there, but but yeah. But they became U.S. citizens, and that's mm. the thing that I think is is really interesting. Mm. This might this might give us full oh my gosh single stage to orbit. Oh my goodness! Um, wow. Take that entire human history of rocketry. <laughs> All you need is a chonky boy with four <laughs> engines. Um, I didn't think I'd be able to do it. No, I didn't think you'd be able to either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here, okay. So to to um, wait till you're at uh, wait till you're at periapsis and fire a gun. To to get us really far out. Yeah. No, I want to see if I can land this thing. Oh, here. okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to click here. I'm gonna hit warp here. And we're going to watch this orbit the world. Very beautiful. Oh my goodness. Um, we in dark. Yeah. Um, let's just appreciate this. I I'm proud of this, so let's just appreciate it for yeah. a moment. We can get back to we can get back to Nazis in a moment. Um, <laughs> Always more time for Nazis. <laughs> I wish there really was. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh God. Um, oh, it's the year 2019, folks. <laughs> <laughs> And we are back. So all it's going to go here. Um, and when we're at Apoapsis, actually, we can, I'm just going to head and go ahead and do it now. I'm going to go retrograde, which means I'm going to point backwards, which will slow us down. And it'll slow down the orbit. We see the circle here. It'll slow down the orbit opposite of where we are. Um, so you see the, the Apoapsis and the Periapsis will shift a little bit. Um, but it'll mostly be changing essentially directly opposite of where I am, which is, I think, really mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, and so we will, it'll shift the periapsis lower, and so it'll get us back in. Um, my landing skills aren't, I will say, stellar. But, but how are, how are Kimlin curves? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Yeah. Um, so let's just use the whole oh, of our rocketry here. Oh my. That's good. That's good. Um, and I'm going to casually warp us to here, um, and I will try to land. This is going to be a little bit long of an episode, but I really want to see if I can land this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to land this in the dark. God um, damn it! <laughs> that's that's a choice. <laughs> it was an accident more than a choice, but it's fine. Um, let me make sure we're facing forward. That's an important piece. Mm. Um, so from here, from Explorer One. Werner von Braun becomes really the head of NASA. And I, I, it makes me wonder mm-hmm. whether um, whether that, whether the, the involvement of Nazi scientists in NASA, mm-hmm. was it NASA at that point? I don't think so. I think NASA came about in like the late 60s. I might be wrong. It was I the might late be entirely 60s. wrong. Um, because it was Eisenhower who, who founded you're NASA. You're right, you're right, you're right. Um, next episode, one thing that I want to get to 
is oh, right. the difference 60s. between late 60s, late 60s oh, is the moon. Yeah, <laughs> my god. Um, All these dates. We weren't alive back then. It's no, fine. It's true. It's, it's fine. It probably didn't even happen. It was 58. Okay, 50. So, yeah, it was founded just after this mm. um, as sort of putting all of the pieces together. And um, actually, we'll land this and talk about the difference between NASA and the Russian cosmonaut program, mm. the Soviet cosmonaut program. I'm shaking my head and shrugging. You can't see it. But it, they're largely the same. Yeah. They're essentially the same. It, um, yeah. Especially in terms of the space program itself, they're basically the same. Mm. I think I've run out of monopropellant to be able to shift my spaceship oh, around. That's not that's not a great thing. It's could be better. <laughs> as soon as we hit air, I'll be able to stabilize, hopefully. Right. Um do some aerobraking. <laughs> but we'll 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 see how this all pans out next time on Let's Play.